Welcome to Life Group. Before we get started tonight, I wanted to make a real quick plug for Growth Track. If you've been coming to Venue Church or maybe just been coming to, to Life Groups, um, but you want to know more about the vision of Venue Church, more about who we are and what it is that we're doing, maybe you want to learn more about yourself, or maybe you want to maybe possibly volunteer in some area, um, Growth Track is the perfect way to be able to, to do that. And it's right after service. It's about an hour long. We provide a light snack and even child care. Um, so we just hope, hope to see you there. Oh, actually, if you want to sign up, you can tell your life group leader tonight, and they can get you signed up for this Sunday. You don't have to take the classes in any particular order. You can take them just, just as you're able to, able to make it. So God bless you guys. Can't wait to see you there. In the beginning, there was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Bible was God, and the Word became the outside world. This is the Word of God. Welcome back to Life Group. Glad to see you guys out again. We are in the second part of a three-part series called Text, where we're just talking about the Bible. Cool thing about the Bible is it's not just a book, it's a library of books. It's got over 66 books in it, matter of fact, written over the course of 1,500 years by 40 different authors. It's got over 1,100 chapters, 31,000 verses. It has over 807,000 words in it. It was written by politicians and statesmen, by farmers and shepherds, by peasants and musicians and poets, and even tax collectors and warriors, and, and not only that, but also written by a doctor as well. It was also uh, written in the wilderness by Moses, by Jeremiah in the dungeon, written by Luke while traveling, by Paul while in prison. It was written by John while he was in exile on the island of Patmos. It's written in over 13 different countries, in over three different continents, in Asia, Africa, and Europe, in three different languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. It covers all different kinds of topics, ranging from marriage, divorce, remarriage, adultery, sex, lust, greed, guilt, materialism, generosity, healing, hope, forgiveness, parenting, prayer, friendship, Pride, obedience, heaven, hell, lying, murder, suicide, rape, fears, doubts, miracles, love, hate, money, criticism, creation, government, submission, rebellion, peace, leadership, comparisons, joy, discontentment, satis uh, sacrifice, delayed gratification, patience, faithfulness, enjoying life, self-control, um, disasters, injustices, demons, angels, discipleship, disciplines, fasting, honor, mercy, caring for the poor, handling wealth, family, and even cats. Well, maybe not cats, but it does talk about the devil, and so it's basically the same thing. But here we go. Here's the question. Given all that about the Bible that we, that we do know and that we do see, what purpose does it serve to ask the question, is the Bible reliable? So Sunday, we also hit on some different aspects, four different concepts as it comes to um, the Bible's reliability. I'm going to run over basically three of them right now, and we'll save the last one for the next question. Also, uh, if you guys have missed any of these messages, you can always get them online. Just go to www.venue.church and click on media. All the messages um, that, we've, that we've done during the series are there and will be there. Um, so he, here's, here's, here's kind of the thing. We talked about, um, number one, proof versus evidence. So you cannot prove anything from history. It's not possible to prove anything from history. Because to prove something, it has to be both observable and and repeatable and you can't observe history nor can you repeat history so basically what you can do is gather all the best evidence that you can find and from that evidence come to a conclusion it's kind of what they do in the court of law they don't actually prove anything they take all the all the evidence put it together and they and, and they they do what's called probable cause now number two that's basically it you've got probability 
versus possibility. There are all kinds of possibilities why things happen. Matter of fact, I told a story about how uh, I got an accident. Me and Faith got an accident coming back from uh, from a work that we used to do before we ever left for Bible school, and we hit um, this Mustang. It was really, really icy out. I hit my brakes. Uh, we we hit this Mustang probably going about five miles an hour, but um, apparently that was all needed for my car. It bent the bump, uh, bumper back and into our tires, and we couldn't drive it. We had to have a tow truck come out and get our car. Uh, the Mustang was completely fine. And so it's all different kinds of possibilities for what could have happened. I could have told the cops when they come that she backed into me. I was I was stopped completely, and she kept on ramming my, my car until my bumper was bent up. I could, she, she could have said that because nothing was damaged on, on her car, I could have said that a, that a bionic squirrel came up and punched my bumper, <laughs> that I didn't actually hit her, that there was no accident. All kinds of possibilities, but probably it was icy out, I hit her car. There's all kinds of possibilities in the Bible for why four, four men would write four separate accounts about one man's life, a, a, a Jewish carpenter's life, over the course of three years. Well, probably what they wrote was true. Now lastly, we talked about ancient manuscripts. And in short, we looked at other ancient manuscripts from the same time period, from Roman time period, where they created vaults to make sure that all their information would always be secure. But the Gallic Wars, we only have 10 copies of the Gallic Wars. The very first document that we find is in 900 AD. Of all the writings of Tacitus, and he wrote 30 different volumes about Roman history. We have... We have less than half of them, and we only have two manuscripts. The first one in 900 A.D., the second one in 1100 A.D. And when it comes to the Bible, we have 5,000 manuscripts of the New Testament alone. We have hundreds of just the four Gospels. We have, we have fragments found as early as 135, fragments of the book of John, in 135 A.D., found in Egypt. And actually, there's a modern-day thing that just came out. They found, they found pieces of Mark left fully 100% intact from as early as 90 AD. This is only a couple of decades, maybe, after it was written. This is huge stuff. No other, no other manuscripts, no other manuscripts in the world from any kind of history, any kind of writing, has anywhere near the credibility that the Bible has. So here's the second question. Taking all that into account, do you think others will be more convinced of the reliability of the Bible by the evidence of the facts or evidence seen in your personal life. So before we tackle this last, last question, I just want to say thank you guys for coming out. So glad you guys are able to be a part of this, and we look forward to seeing you this Sunday. Hey, maybe even just grab a friend or a neighbor or a coworker and make them tag along with you. By, by make, I mean buy them lunch. So anyways, let's get to this very last question. The four things that we're going to consider today is just why is this not included in secular history? The fourth thing we considered Sunday was why is this not included in secular history? If there's all this, what we, what we feel is great evidence and great probability that the gospel writers actually wrote the truth, and if it's the, one of the most historical documents, if not the most historical document ever proven and written, then why is it included in secular history? And here's what we came up with. I really believe it has more to do with things being supernatural than anything else. I think people have a hard time with that. There's this predisposition that when they're looking at Bible scriptures and they see something that's supernatural, automatically they think, well, I can't believe this, or I can't, this can't be trusted, or it's not reliable because it deals with the supernatural, and I just don't believe in the supernatural. I've never seen anything supernatural. My mom's never seen anything supernatural, so basically supernatural things can't exist. But I think it's unfair. I think it's not reasonable or logical to place our 21st century viewpoint on ancient history and say because we view this now because I view this in my limited experience that it's not true in the past either it's like saying that the Holocaust never existed why because I wasn't there I didn't see it not only that I've never seen that kind of hatred ever my mom's never seen that kind of hatred my, my friends and, and my family they've never seen any kind of hatred that rivals that that one man can turn a whole nation against a race of people and exterminate them it's crazy to think. 
It's like saying that I don't really believe firemen went into the Twin Towers when, when it crashed down. They knowingly went in to save people knowing that they themselves were probably going to die trying to do it. Why? Because I've never done that. I never run into a burning or anywhere, matter of fact, to give my life for somebody else. My mom has it. My, 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 uh, my family has it. My friends have it. My coworkers. I've never seen that kind of person be that heroic ever in my life. And so because I've not seen it, because I've not heard it, I've not experienced it, 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 it can't exist. It's the same kind of logic. So here's, here's the last and final question for today. How would you live... If you believe that all the parts, I mean heaven, hell, miracles, salvation, grace, mercy, forgiveness, all the parts of the Bible were actually true.